in him. Because in him, I am safe. In him, I have comfort. In Here at Chapel Street, we do believe that God is generous. We believe the gospel is generous and that God calls us as his people to be a generous people. Years ago, we defined generosity as freedom from smallness of heart. And one of the things the gospel does in us is set us free from selfishness, from greed, from smallness of heart, so that we can give in all kinds of ways. And here at Chapel Street, if you're just getting started with a life of generosity, there's lots of ways to give uh, through the church and through an app and through electronic means. But every year we choose a partner somewhere in the world that we call a serve the world partner that we want to um, bless with a gift at this time of year. It's uh, something we collect over the month of December, and we just give it away. And this year, our partner, as you know, is Hope School, which is in a war-torn part of Africa. We can't even tell you the country's name because it's dangerous. And a family lives there that's establishing this school called Hope School. And they have a building that's 86,000 square feet that's been donated to them, and they need to finish that building so they can multiply that ministry of hope to children and families in that part of the world. And we've set a goal as a church. It's a very ambitious goal. This is one of the most difficult projects we've taken on in all the years we've been doing this. But we've set a goal to raise $500,000. That's right. That's a half a million dollars in the month of December just to give to Hope School. This gift will enable them to multiply their impact tenfold from about 150 kids to 1,500 kids and all those families in that part of the world. So if you are blessed to be able to participate, we would encourage you to do that prayerfully. If you'd like to find out how to give to serve the world to this partner, you can use your phone and scan the code in the back of the chair in front of you. We would love to have you participate in that this December. So thank you so much for that. Well, when Paige introduced uh, the service, she talked a bit about the Christmas spirit. And I ran into a survey, kind of a list this week, of the top 10 ways to get into the Christmas spirit. So I want to see how we're all doing with regard to the Christmas spirit. So I want you to just raise your hand if you've done any one of these 10. I'm going to tick through them pretty quickly, okay? Top 10 ways to get into the Christmas spirit. Number one, listen to Christmas music. How many of you are playing Christmas music at home? There you go. Do you know what the top-selling Christmas album is of all time? Elvis, Christmas album. Still, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? Number two, put up Christmas decorations. Some of you may recognize the house. That is whose house? That is the Griswold house. That's right. Okay, number three, how many of you have watched Christmas movies already? Okay, pretty good. You know what the top two Christmas movies of all time are, according to one list at least? It's a Wonderful Life. And the Christmas story, people always say home alone, but that came in a distant third. Okay, number four, bake Christmas cookies. How many of you bake cookies? Ooh, somebody said they've eaten cookies, haven't baked cookies. I don't even know what these are called, but these are my favorite, All right? Number five, celebrate family traditions. Most of those are like Christmas Eve, but this is one of our family traditions. Every year at Christmas time, sometime, we drive down to Leonard Circle in Aurora and see the whole display. If you've not done that, look it up on the internet. It's a fun thing to do for a family, especially a young family. Number six, shop for loved ones. How many of you done your shopping already? Anybody finished? Oh, a few of you people. Okay, just a few. Go on a Christmas lights drive. Anybody done that yet? All right. Number se- uh, donate choice. Donate toys to a charity. Okay, good, thank you. Or give to serve the world. Uh, Write and send Christmas cards. Doing cards, is that still a thing? Yep. Read the Christmas story in the Bible. Now there's an idea we can do. All right, now what is the Christmas spirit? I came across this definition. The Christmas spirit is a magical and festive feeling of togetherness. It's a feeling of general kindness and joy where we are more generous, more forgiving, and become better versions of ourselves. Hmm, That's pretty good. Then I found this from Scientific American. Cultural traditions provide strong guidelines that tell us how we should behave during this time of year. We're encouraged to be joyful, charitable, generous, and kind. All this is probably tied to the natural rhythms of the seasons. In much of the Northern Hemisphere, the end of the year is the period following the harvest. Our ancestors would finally have time to visit with others and open their homes to guests. As it is also the darkest time of the year, we're psychologically looking to others for warmth and comfort. The code of generosity, kindness, and charity toward others is enforced by the community. After all, we are the sum of the individuals around us who generate the collective force that governs and organizes our social structure. Well, that kind of takes the fun out of it, doesn't it? (laughs) 
We're in the second week of an Advent series uh, that's not about the Christmas spirit, but rather about the spirit of Christmas. We're looking at what might be called the hidden character in the great story, the character we typically pay little attention to, and that is the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Last week, Pastor Jeff began the series by taking us back to the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, who prophesied 700 years before Jesus' birth that one would come who would be like a shoot, like a branch from the stump of Jesse, one on whom the Spirit of God would rest in great power and wisdom, one who would rule and judge with righteousness and faithfulness, talking about the promise of a Messiah, a Savior. Today we're going to look in Luke chapter 1, which is kind of the prequel to Luke 2, which is the more familiar story that we all read at this time of the year. And we're going to look at three passages out of that one chapter where we'll see the role of the Holy Spirit in preparing the way for Jesus the Messiah. First, Luke chapter 1, verse 5, where we'll begin. So you can watch it on the screens, and I'll make some comments. Luke writes, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, I'm going to stop there. Notice the historical reference here. This is, we can pass right by this, but this is significant. Because the story of Jesus' birth is not, as many in our culture think it to be, just religious mythology. Luke goes out of his way to anchor the story in history, in real time and real place. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Now notice again, the historical and cultural details here. Luke is a Gentile of Greek birth, but he also did his research into all the Jewish traditions and cultures. Verse 7, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Now this should remind you of a story from the Old Testament way back in the book of Genesis when God promised a child to an aging Abraham and Sarah as their promised child. Verse 8, now while he was serving as a priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. Now, this would have likely been one of the, most, one of the greatest honors of Zechariah's entire life as a priest. There were hundreds of priests at that time. And for one man, they would usually get one chance in a lifetime as a priest to get to go into the altar to offer this incense. Verse 11, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. His fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink uh, wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Now this part of the story is about preparation. The preparation of the spirit. And that's the first point as we go along today. How many of you recognize what this little guy is? Do we recognize that? I'll come back to it in just a minute. Well, one of my main jobs in preparing for Christmas at our house is putting up our outdoor lights. So every year, usually during the week of Thanksgiving, I go up to our attic and drag out a couple of big garbage bags stuffed full of the strands of lights. And then I painstakingly plug each strand in to see if they work still after a year. And then I go to the store to replace all the ones that aren't working because inevitably like 20% of them don't work anymore. I don't know why, but they just don't. And then I come back and then I, then I carefully wrap the, some strands around the tree trunks, string them up into the branches. And then the hardest part of the job is clicking, uh, clipping the uh, icicle lights to the gutter of our house. That's where these little things come in. You have to clip them to the gutter and you string them along the gutter of your house. And we like to have those up. But it's a hard job. And so one of my sons last year came out to help me um, because it involves standing on the top of a ladder uh, to clip them in, and I'm not as nimble as I once was. So he climbs up on the ladder, and I hand him these little clips and the lights, and he, we clip them in. you got to put one about every two or three feet along the whole length of the gutter. So we were clipping these in, one after the other, stringing the lights up, and we must have got 20 or 25 clips in, maybe 30 or 40 feet 
of these icicle lights. And then something happened, and one of them came loose, and the weight of the strand of lights began to unclip the, the clips one at a time. <laughs> all the way down, and the whole thing came down. And there was a distinct and sudden leaking of Christmas spirit <laughs> all over our driveway. So this year we got smart. We used duct tape. About every two feet, we put a little thing of duct tape on there, and they stay up. Luke tells us here that God is preparing Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth for the birth of a child. We read in Luke chapter 1, verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall name, call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. First thing we see is God is preparing them for the birth of a miraculous child. The child, of course, we know as John the Baptist, or in sometimes John the Baptizer, and I like that actually better, because that way it doesn't sound like he's part of the denomination, like John the Methodist or John the Presbyterian. John the Baptist. But before we get to the child, let me talk about, a wait, about waiting just a bit. About waiting. At this point of the, in this whole story arc of the Bible, the Israelites are waiting for the promise of a Messiah. It's been some 700 years since the prophet Isaiah said, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Jeff talked about that last week. It's been 700 years since the prophet Micah wrote, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, through, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. And on top of that waiting of a whole nation, a whole people, Zechariah and Elizabeth, this one couple, have also been waiting. Luke tells us that they are both righteous before God, and they've walked blamelessly in the commandments and statutes of the Lord, but they have not been able to have children. Luke says Elizabeth is barren. Now that was a very painful thing in the Old Testament. In, the old, uh, in that culture. Usually uh, childlessness was blamed on the woman in those days, and it was a source of great pain and even shame in that culture. We're also told that they were advanced in years, and it's a, that's a kind of a polite way of saying they were old. In that culture, this phrase is used for people usually 60 and over. And then the angel shows up and says, your prayer has been heard, you will have a son. And here's what I thought about. Can you imagine... How many times over the years, Zechariah and Elizabeth prayed to God asking for a child? Can you imagine how many times they'd been on their knees? And imagine their disappointment month after month and year after year until they were too old to even think about having a child anymore. In fact, I think it's very likely they had long since stopped asking God to bless them with a child. Can you imagine what that waiting was like for them? Maybe you can. My guess would be many of you know what it's like to wait, not just for a child, but to wait. You're praying for something. Maybe even right now, you're praying for something that seems good, that seems to be a thing of blessing, but it's just not happening, and you're waiting. What I see in this story is that waiting is part of faith. Waiting is part of excuse me, of prayer. And in many ways, I think we could say that waiting is faith. That waiting is prayer. And the Holy Spirit uses our waiting for preparation. Last week, Jeff said that we live between the advents. We live between the first advent when God became flesh and Jesus was born of a virgin in Bethlehem and the second advent when Jesus, as the risen king of heaven, will return in great power and glory to redeem all things. We live between those two advents and we wait. In Romans chapter 8, the apostle Paul talks about the relationship between waiting and hope. He writes, and not, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, for the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait 
for it with patience. So Zechariah's prayers are finally answered. Elizabeth will have a son, but notice the prayer is answered not to answer their desires to have a child, but it's answered because of God's purpose in the world. God says four things about this child. First, he will be great before the Lord. Here's what Jesus would later say about John the baptizer. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. John was great because he pointed people to Jesus. Secondly, he must not drink wine or strong drink. This is a reference back to an Old Testament rite called the Nazarite vow, a vow that certain priests made before God that simply indicated that he was dedicated, his whole life was dedicated to the service of God. Thirdly, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Now, what does this mean? Now, throughout the Old Testament and prior to the Spirit coming at Pentecost in the book of Acts, uh, to be filled with the Holy Spirit was was a relatively rare thing. God would pour out his Spirit here and there on certain people chosen for certain tasks in his will. For example, to speak his word or to confront sin and injustice or to live holy lives or to accomplish great things, great victories. And God will empower this son of Elizabeth and Zechariah in all those same ways. What's unique about this child is that he's filled from the Spirit from even before he was born. We'll come back to that in a moment. We need to remember now that this same Holy Spirit that's being talked about here is promised to all of us who are believers in Christ. Paul tells us through Ephesians chapter 1, In him, that is Christ, You also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So the very same Holy Spirit that filled John the Baptist in his mother's womb is the same power that dwells in us. Not every now and then, not just uh, some days and not others, not just once in a while, but he dwells in us and is promised to us by Jesus himself to live with us forever. He lives in you. And lastly, we see his name will be John. John was a common name at the time. It simply means Yahweh is gracious. And next, we see that this child will prepare the way for the Messiah. Verse 16, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him. Have to ask ourselves, who is the him Here, this is a reference to the Messiah, to the prophet Isaiah has spoken of, the one who is the branch from the stump of Jesse. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Now, this is a reference to one of the last prophecies in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. Now we see God's purpose for this child. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. When John began his public prophetic ministry, here's his preaching message. He said, repent, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And Matthew's gospel tells us that people flocked into the wilderness to hear John's preaching and to confess their sins and allow him to baptize them. But John the baptizer also said in Matthew chapter 3, I I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming, referring to Jesus, is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So the central purpose of John's life is to prepare the way for Jesus. Here's a question for you. Who was your John the Baptist. If you're a believer in Christ today, someone somewhere along the way prepared you for faith in Christ, helped lead you toward him. Who was that person or who were those people? No one comes to faith alone. But there's a second question I want to ask, and that is how does the Holy Spirit, who dwells in you by faith, want to use you to prepare the way for someone else to meet Jesus? The Spirit prepares the way. Secondly, we see the declaration of the Spirit in this story. The declaration of the Spirit. 
My wife and I had two grandchildren born this year into our family. Uh, A granddaughter, Eden, who was born to Mike and his wife, Gianna. And that's her face every time she sees her Papa B. (laughs) And our grandson, Kish, born to our son, Jordan, and his wife, Hanukkah, just just about a month ago. Uh, And each couple announced the the coming birth of their children in different ways. Mike and Gianna made their announcement by having their two-year-old daughter walk up to the front of our house wearing a t-shirt that said big sister and we noticed right away and we celebrated with great joy you know but Jordan and Hanukkah announced it in a different way uh, we had had dinner at their house and after dinner they served dessert and coffee and they had put a spoon that we were going to use to put sugar in our coffee and on the little bowl of the spoon there's a tiny message we're having a baby but we were so unsuspecting that when my wife picked up the spoon she's used it to stir the coffee and we didn't even notice And then they had to keep prompting us to use the spoon multiple times. And when she finally, we finally saw the message, you know, there was screaming and there was yelling and there was tears. And my wife was pretty excited too, you know, so. (laughs) Our reaction to both announcements, of course, was great joy. Luke here gives us a kind of birth announcement, verse 39. In those days, Mary... Now, Mary had already been visited by the angel Gabriel at this point. She's learned that she's going to be with child by the Holy Spirit. We're going to tell her story next week. And, uh, and she has heard that her relative Elizabeth is also expecting in her advanced age. So naturally, she wants to go visit and see Elizabeth. So in those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. There's that same phrase again. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? (coughs) Excuse me. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. So we saw that when God told Zechariah he would have a son, the son would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now we see the same exact phrase used for his wife, Elizabeth. She is filled with the Holy Spirit, and then she makes two declarations. First, the declaration of blessing. Luke says, she exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So through the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth declares or pronounces a blessing on Elizabeth and the child that she carries. In other words, the Spirit enables Elizabeth to declare the identity of Mary as the mother of the divine child and the identity of her child. You know, the Apostle Paul teaches us that the Holy Spirit does the same for each one of us. In Romans chapter 8, he says, The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies, declares with our spirit that we are God's children. So if you're a follower of Jesus today, if you put your faith in him, the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in you, and not only to dwell in you, but to declare, to remind you, to pronounce that you are a child of God. You belong to him. And he tells you who you are, and you have an eternal inheritance through him. Secondly, we see here a declaration of lordship. Elizabeth says in verse 43, And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. It's the Holy Spirit that enables Elizabeth to recognize the child that Mary carries is the promised Messiah and Savior. How else could she have known this? In fact, Elizabeth is the first person in the Bible to call Jesus Lord. And she does so by the Holy Spirit. A little side uh, note here. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but this is a, this is a, a, a very uh, amazing little scene. Because what we have here is one unborn child in Elizabeth who leaps for joy at the presence, at the divine presence of another unborn child. It's an amazing thing to wrap your mind around. God ministering through unborn children. And this, uh, so it's the Holy Spirit that moves within us in the same way to come to faith in, in Jesus as Lord. If you, you put your faith in him, it's through the work of the Holy Spirit. It allows us to worship him as Lord and fills our hearts with joy as we worship him. Happened even here this morning. 
Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. And then the third thing we're going to see in chapter 1 of Luke is the promise of the Spirit. Now, before I uh, read this next text, I need to remind you a bit of Zechariah's story, part we didn't read today. After the angel Gabriel comes to Zechariah and tells him that his prayers have been heard, his wife's going to have a son uh, in his old age, he actually questions the angel. In verse 18 of Luke 1, he says, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. And then the angel says to him, verses 19 and 20, and I, this makes me smile, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. I think Gabriel here is just a little bit annoyed with Zechariah. He, so he gets out his business card. He says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have told you what's going to happen. And he says, verse 20, and now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. So for nine months, Zechariah cannot speak. He's rendered mute. And when a child is finally born, here's what we read, verse 67. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the third time we've seen that in Luke chapter 1. And prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. And he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Verse 76. And you, child, speaking to his child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Because the tender mercy of our God, where, uh, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So the Holy Spirit enables Zechariah to see and understand two things. First, the promise of salvation. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people And has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Zechariah says, notice, he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation in the house of David. These are references to the Messiah. But he's speaking in the past tense. Only the Holy Spirit could have allowed him to see that the child was already on the way. God had already chosen to deliver his people through this child. The Spirit enables him to understand and see that the miraculous son born to his wife, is going to prepare the way for the miraculous son that's growing in Mary's body, who would save his people from their sins. Secondly, the Holy Spirit enables Zechariah to see the promise of forgiveness. The promise of forgiveness, verse 76, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways and to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Now, this is why the child leaps in Elizabeth's womb. This is why the child leaps for joy. Because this is the great cry of humanity, is it not? How shall we be saved from the brokenness in the world all around us? How shall we be forgiven for the brokenness that is in us? This is the cry of every human heart, of each and every one of us. How shall I be saved? How shall I be forgiven? And the answer is Jesus. The miraculous child of Luke chapter 1, John, is preparing the way for the miraculous child of Luke chapter 2, who is Jesus. Now, here's what we take away from this passage. If you are a follower of Jesus today, then the Holy Spirit dwells in you. You have been filled, in that sense, with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit wants to declare to you, you are a child of God. And the Holy Spirit wants to use you to help prepare the way for others. And if you're here this morning and you have not ever made that decision to trust Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and your salvation, even now the Spirit is preparing the way for you. We're going to close the service with communion in just a moment. And Communion is a great time through bread and cup to celebrate. If you're a follower of Jesus, celebrate what the Spirit has done for you, that the Spirit dwells in you. The Spirit assures you you're a child of God. 
through the forgiveness of sins. And if you're not sure yet, this becomes a moment in time when you can take that bread and that cup and recognize that the one promise has come and the Spirit has prepared your heart for this moment when you can put your faith in him. So bow with me for prayer and then we'll take communion together. Lord, I thank you today for your word. Your word that reminds us that in the midst of all our preparation for Christmas and all the fun that we have in the midst of the celebration, there's something much, much deeper. Your spirit reminds us of the joy of your coming into the world, the joy of knowing our sins can be forgiven, knowing that we can belong to you now and for all eternity. So may your spirit, even now, declare that you are Lord. And may we put our faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you'll take your cups, I want you to take the cup and just look at them for a second. These are kind of new. There's a smaller and a larger end. The smaller end, turn up to the top, and that's where the bread is. So peel back that top layer and hold it, and let me lead us through the taking of the bread. On the night before he died, the Lord Jesus met at a table with his disciples, what we call the Last Supper. At some point in that meal, he took bread, and he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Let's do this now in remembrance of him. Now just turn the cup over, and the larger side is the, is the juice. So peel that carefully. The Bible tells us that after the bread, Jesus also poured a cup. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sin. As his followers today, we know that the Apostle Paul said that each time we drink from this cup, we remember his death until he comes again. Do this remembrance of him. Out there. Receive now the benediction. May we go now in the name of the one who was promised, the one who came, the one who was present by his spirit, and the only one who can forgive and save. His name is Jesus. Amen. Have a great day.